Hi there, on the bench today is another piece of vintage test equipment, a Wayne Kerr component meter B424, which is basically an LCR meter. Even without power, it's already obvious that the LCD display has some major problems. On the rear, we have connections to add either 2 volts for internal bias voltage if the two red terminals are bridged, or an external bias voltage between the middle red and the black terminal. Any bias is only applied when measuring capacitors. There's a switch between normal operations and the limits unit. The limits unit was an optional add-on device which allowed setting of an upper and lower limit and would alert if a tested component was within or without. I don't have a limits unit, but if I had, it would connect to the 9-pin socket. There are connections for a DC power supply between 12 and 20 volts. This allowed, for example, operating the unit from external batteries, like two PP9s in series. And finally, there is the mains connection. As the label explains, the B424 mains connection is not controlled by the front switch, or indeed any switch, so you are supposed to physically pull the plug when it's not in use. The specs are not too bad. It covers the range of 10 milliohms to 20 megohms, 0.1 picofarad to 20 millifarad and 0.1 microhenry to 2000 henrys with generally 0.25% accuracy. There are 8 ranges and the table shows for each type of measurement what frequency and voltage is used. The switching of frequency and test voltage is automatic with no manual intervention. It uses a sine wave of either 100 Hz or 1 kHz. For a first test, easiest is of course R or resistance and I connect a resistance decay box set to 100 ohms to the B424. Despite the problems with the LCD, the display is somewhat readable, good. And changing to other resistance values on the decay box seems to work just fine. That is, until I exceed 1K. The decade is set to 1100 ohms, but the display only shows 100 ohms. The leading one is missing. At 2K, it just shows 999 instead of 1999, but if I select the next higher range, it shows 2K. I found the same problem of the missing leading one for capacitance and inductance as well. There are three main screws on the bottom, but then it turns out the feet have to be removed too, so in total 7 screws to remove. This finally allows removing the bottom lid. And also to slide out the whole chassis out of the enclosure. The whole thing consists of a sandwich of two boards and some more circuitry at the rear panel. The top board can be lifted after removing the two nuts and an extra screw at the rear and two more screws that hold the display. The top board, which is the digital board, is on hinges and can be flipped open while still staying connected to the analog board below. The B424 stays fully functional in this mode, which is nice. Some parts of the rear panel are protected by a cardboard cover, presumably to prevent accidental touch of high voltage circuitry. The decidedly analog looking section on the upper left of the digital board is actually a part of the power supply, namely a complex regulator that produces the plus 5, minus 5 and plus 2 volt rails used. The second prominent part is a diode matrix which decodes functions and indicators for the display. Lastly, the LCD display itself hangs from the digital board. I carefully inspected the LCD and its wiring as well as the digital board for any cold soldering joints or broken traces, but it all looked fine. Since the error occurs only on the leading one, regardless of range or L or C or R mode, it's almost certain that the problem is in the digital part or in the LCD itself. The digital part looks quite complex. Basically, there is an integrated 3.5 digit DVM chip here, an MC14435, which is of course long obsolete. That chip produces a multiplexed output consisting of four signals showing the value of a digit in BCD code and four other signals to indicate which digit is being sent. On the right is the generator for creating a rectangular wave for the LCD. It runs at about 91 Hz. 
Next, we have three BCD27 segment latching decoders. There is no need for a fourth chip because the highest digit can only be 0 or 1 since the DVM can only do 0 to 1999. These signals and signals from the diode matrix, which is on a different schematic, then go to the display. A closer look at the part connecting to the display. The leading one of the LCD is tagged with the number 41. On the drivers above, the number 41, helpfully labeled 1000, is the output of pin 3 of an XOR gate marked with a label D. The little table on the left shows that D is IC512 and of a type 4030 which has four of these gates. I mark the location of the IC512 on the digital board and the pinout of the CD4030E. So let's have a look at the driver for the leading one. The IC512 is easy to find, but I need to remember that the pinout of the chip is now reversed as I'm looking at it from the bottom instead of the top as in the datasheet drawing. Pin 2 has a steady 91Hz rectangular wave as the input that is also connected to the other three gates in this chip. The input at pin 1 is at plus 5 volts high at the moment because I have the resistance decade set to 1200 ohms. Flipping the thousands in the decade between 0 and 1, thus 200 or 1200 ohms, should toggle the state of pin 1 if the analog board and the DVM chip work correctly. So all this is working fine. What about the output of this gate, pin 3? What is this? This doesn't look right. The distortion could be caused by a bad LCD, but there is absolutely no change when I flip pin 1 and that's wrong. So it looks as if this gate has gone bad. Moreover, just by touching pin 3 I can make the 1 appear on the LCD, so the LCD is not to blame here. The amazing thing on the B424 is that everything is on sockets, which makes replacing the chip super fast. It does turn out that the chip is actually a CD4070, not a 4030, but these are pin compatible. In fact, all the 4030 chips in this meter are actually 4070s, so I decided to replace like for like with a brand new 4070. It appears that the original 4030 chips had issues and were replaced with an improved design in form of the 4070s. I believe these days new 4030s are actually just rebadged 4070s. The new chip is in and with the resistance decay set to 200 ohms, the output at pin 3 looks a lot neater. Flipping the resistance decay to 1200 ohm and hooray, the leading one appears. Not sure if you can see it, but the display reads 1199. And the output on pin 3 is still a nice crisp square wave. Let me explain what's going on here. First of all, if you check the truth table of an XOR gate, you can see that with input B0, the output C follows whatever is happening on input A. If A is 0, C is 0. If A is 1, C is 1. But if B is set to 1, the output C is doing the opposite of what happened at A. If A is 0, C is 1. And if A is 1, C goes to 0. An LCD must be driven by AC, never DC. In the B424, a 90Hz generator delivering a square wave is connected to the backplane of all LCD segments and also to one input of all XOR gates. If the other input of the XOR gate is zero, then the output connected to a specific LCD segment has exactly the same square wave. From the LCD points of view, the voltage difference between the backplane and the segment is always zero. If the output of the XOR is 0, so is the backplane, and if the output of the XOR is 5 volts, the backplane is also 5 volts, so the voltage difference is 0. If the second input of the XOR is driven high, the XOR reverses the phase of the square wave at its output. The LCD segment now sees an AC voltage with 10 volts peak to peak, because if the backplane voltage is 5 volts, the element voltage is 0, so the difference is 5. If the backplane goes to 0, the segment voltage is now 5 volts and the difference is now 0 minus 5, which is minus 5. The resulting AC voltage makes the segment appear. By the way, it could well be that the bleed in the LCD was caused by the dodgy driver gate, 
because this could have caused a pulsing DC voltage and LCDs degrade quickly when DC is applied. To demonstrate that this really works, this co-picture shows the difference between the square wave to the backplane and the output of the XOR gate. When the second input of the XOR is zero, the difference is zero with just some small spikes when the square wave changes state. If the second input is one, we get a nice AC square wave. By the way, I did test the failed chip and it's indeed not working. I did this because the problem with sockets is that sometimes they can cause contact problems and I wanted to make sure this wasn't the case here. The date codes on the chips indicate that this unit is probably from 1984. So as a matter of course, I decided to quickly check the health of the electrolytic caps, starting with the main smoothing cap in the power supply. No problem here and the same for the other electrolytic caps. There are still two issues that I want to improve. One is the readability of the LCD and the other the weird power supply. Tackling the power supply first, it's kind of strange that as long as the mains power remains plugged in, the transformer, rectifier and large smoothing cap are all continuously powered. The switch on the front plate does two things. One part connects an red LED to the secondary of the transformer, so this LED is in fact AC powered, and a second normal diode in reverse direction makes sure it survives the reverse peak voltage of about 17 volts. The other part of the switch connects the DC from the smoothing cap to the regulator and this turns the unit on. So not only is half of the power supply constantly running when using mains, the other effect is that if the B424 is powered from the DC sockets at the back, the red LED at the front will not light when the unit is switched on. I suspect it's to minimize the current draw when running from an external battery. This B424, however, will be usually powered from mains, so the need to physically unplug the power cord or similar measures are inconvenient. There is a fairly easy way to modify the circuit, so the front switch actually switches the mains power on or off. I can remove the switching of the red power LED and instead connect it to the secondary of the transformer permanently. That's okay, because with the so freed switch contacts, I'm going to switch the primary side which in turn means the red LED is still only coming on when the unit is running on mains power. To switch the primary side, I need to break the connection after the fuse and then run it to the switch. A look on the switch rating shows that it's good for 3 amps at 250 volts, which is way more than what the B424 needs. The two red wires are the connection to the regulator and I'm going to keep this as is. The two pink wires are the connection to the red LED and this will be replaced. After removing the heat shrink from the pink wires, they can be desoldered. It turns out that the red LED is so close that I can solder the wire to the secondary directly to the LED, removing the small wire to the switch completely. So the red LED is now permanently connected to the secondary side of the transformer. The freed contacts are now used to switch the mains using appropriate mains rated wires. I ran the new connection along the support bar and used cable ties to secure it. Apologies for the slightly out of focus image. The mains fuse has a cover over it. I could just snip one of the wires and connect the ends to my new wires going to the switch, but that means two joints, which is a bit ugly. To have only one joint, I slid the cover of the fuse back to expose the wiring and then desoldered the one going to the transformer and pulled it out of the cover. Then I pushed one of my new wires into the cover and soldered it to where the original wire was. My wires have definitely a much larger diameter, but that was the only mains rated wire I had lying around. After my wire is attached, I pull the fuse cover back over the rear of the fuse for continued protection. Now all that's left is to solder the original wire to the other one of my wires so the circuit now goes from the fuse to the switch and then back to the transformer primary. Some heat shrinking insulation over this single joint and it can be safely tucked away. I connected the multimeter across the smoothing cap. Let's see if everything works as it should. Mains is connected and no voltage on the cap. Good. Now turning the front switch on and the red LED lights and there's a slightly above 17 volts on the capacitor. That works as it should. 
Turning the power off on the switch reveals a slight issue. The capacitor stays charged. The switch took off the mains power, but it also disconnects the load in form of the regulator. It will take hours before this capacitor is discharged. This is not a problem by itself, just something to remember if you work on the power supply. I could of course connect a discharge resistor across the cap to speed that up, similar to what I'm doing here, but I have another thing in mind which will solve this problem as well. The LCD is kind of on the way out, but readability could be improved a lot with some form of backlight. I experimented with shining an LED on the side into the glass, but this LCD doesn't work that way. It might be possible to remove the backing and shine a light through the PCB as a diffuser, but this is a rather tricky operation and lots of work. Even though the soldering is actually in the way, the LCD is much more readable when shining a bright torch from the bottom. The camera doesn't give it justice how much the readability improves. So let's construct a fairly higher power torch. With high power I mean light output not power consumption because the B424 power supply is not the strongest. I decided to connect it directly to the smoothing cap. This has several advantages. The high voltage of 17 volts allows me to use multiple LEDs in series which keeps the current consumption down and it neatly discharges the capacitor when the power is turned off. I did some tests and three high efficiency LEDs running at a total of about 10 milliamps should make plenty of light without stressing the LED or the power supply. The necessary resistor isn't a norm value, so I used the next standard value, which means it will be running at 12 milliamps, but that's no problem. This is my torch replacement that I will install below the LCD. It makes plenty of light. The LEDs are glued on a thick cardboard carrier, which means they can be removed without leaving a trace. At 17 volts, which is the voltage across the capacitor when power is on, my contraption consumes about 12 milliamps. The board mounts on an existing screw that holds a bracket for the input terminals. If you are wondering, I angle the two outside LEDs to give more even coverage over the whole length of the LCD. Finally, the two wires, white and orange, from my LED torch light are soldered directly to the smoothing cup. Let's try it. It works just fine. As I said, it looks much better in reality than on camera. Some more tests, a 10 nanofarad capacitor, a 0.33 microfarad capacitor, an inductor with 137 millihenry. And when powering off, the light fades slowly away as the big smoothing capacitor is discharged. Here's a better camera angle while measuring a 100 microfarad capacitor. In C mode, it agrees with my other meters within 0.5%. The L mode is a bit worse at 0.8% but that might well be because I was comparing readings taken at 1 kHz when the B424 had switched to 100 Hz. Some cull work may be needed. The B424 can also give the ESR which is 0.18 ohms in this case. I measured the accuracy of the B424 in resistance mode and up to 1 meg it's excellent at around 0.1% against the Agilent 3441A. Although with my backlight, the display now works fairly well, it might be that the LCD is so damaged that it will eventually stop working. The LCD is obviously a custom job made specifically for this device, so it will be unobtainable. One possible way out is to sniff the connections with an Arduino or Raspberry Pi and use the data to drive a new display. It's not necessary to have all 40 connections as inputs, basically just the decimal points and the unit information and the arrows. The output of the DVM can be obtained directly as a BCD code and the digit select info, which reduces the needed IOs. There are even connectors on the PCB to access this information, but whether the B424 is worth all this effort is of course something to be considered when the time comes. For now it's working and can be read reasonably well. If you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There are many more projects, repairs and reviews coming up and it would be great if you decided supporting this channel by becoming a Patreon. Thanks for watching.